All right, all right, all right. Who's excited to be in church? Oh, pretty good. South Campus showing up. North Campus, welcome. We love you, Pastor Jason, Pastor Liz, Pastor Mike, and Pastor Mitzi downtown. We're partying all across the city today. Love being one church in several locations. Excited for those to keep growing. For you in the north and the downtown, we just made an exciting announcement in the south that Pastor Quincy and Pastor Mandy are taking over the South Campus as our campus pastors. So if you know them, when you see them, high five them. Pastor Quincy's one of my best friends on the planet. Love running with him. And I like Mandy too. She's really cool. Um, And so we're just excited that we get to do life together in this new capacity. And so it's a great day, great time, great season for our church It's a great season just to be alive, guys. The NFL started on Thursday night. It wasn't a very good game, but it was the NFL. It was beautiful and wonderful. God is faithful, and his his mercies are new every morning. Just like you can count on the first week of September every year, the NFL starts again. Then it starts again. You can count on Jesus. Um, If you've got a Bible, we're going to start today in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It has been our theme scripture over the last several weeks. We're going to be here for another couple of weeks. Um, Today also marks uh, really uh, kind of the launch of EC groups. Last week, registration opened, but this week, like, we start hanging out in our groups. Your life is your group. If you don't have a group, you don't have a life. Right? How's that? That'll breach. Write that down. Okay. Uh, I just want to encourage you, get connected, get in a group, meet some people, do life with some people. We've got a lot of great freedom groups and connecting groups and sports groups and all these different groups happening. We've got new fresh start groups where if you're new on your journey of faith, sign up for a fresh start group. There's multiple happening around the city. Get in there. Get if, if You don't even have to be new. If you just want to kick start in your faith and some of the basics, sign up for one of those groups. We're just excited for everything that God's doing in our community in this season. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. I'll heal their land. I want to read one more scripture to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. It says, now to him, I feel like this one's kind of the New Testament version of that first one. You know, that first one's like, hey, do this. God's got all these great things he wants to do. This one says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is getting ready to do something new in our church, new in your life, new in this season. Not just new in you. I believe new through you. I believe lives are about to be changed. People are about to get saved. Prayers are about to be answered. Miracles are on the way. God's got something new for us in this season. He's not finished with you yet. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's not done. Go to the other side and say, he's not done. I, I deliberated saying, like, he ain't done. But I felt like that didn't have, just didn't sound as educated. Um, Second Chronicles, basically, that's the message from God. He's not finished. I'm not finished. I'm not finished yet. So if, if we will, here's the conditional clause, if, if we will humble ourselves, pray, seek him, and turn from our sin, repent, then God will heal, forgive, and hear our prayers. He hears us, he heals, and he forgives. If we will, then God will. People don't like this about God. Why does he need me to do something in order to give me the good stuff? Because it's a relationship. That's the way every relationship works. I made the choice to marry my wife, but that choice came with responsibilities. And when I uphold my end of those responsibilities, things go good for me. When I don't hold up my end of those responsibilities, there are repercussions. It's less positive for me when I don't husband at the level that I'm supposed to husband. If I will, then she will. Any relationship with God is very similar. If we do, then he does. If we will, there are some conditions 
here. And I believe that God is getting ready to redeem people, to restore people, to reclaim people, to replenish and refresh people like we've never seen happen before in the history of our church. And it starts on the other end of a condition. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you're here today. God, thank you that you're in all of our campuses across the city, all of our services. You've got something amazing you want to do and you want to speak to us. We give you our full attention in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I know I might sound a little bit weird today. I do have a halls like right here, and then I've got another, a backup one over here. And so if I drool, that's why. It's because I've, 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 I'm double-barreled. And um, I have SARS, so I apologize. And I'm just kidding. I don't. I don't. That's not funny. That's not funny. That's a, that's a real thing. I've got the black lung. Okay. Uh, it's, funny how, it's funny how when you get married, um, you kind of you step into this lifelong committed relationship, and then you, just, you also step into hearing impairment. Uh, things just, it just doesn't work like it used to. And I understand that listening is more than just being aware of a sound, but it, it seems like, you know, in marriage something happens. Like, like I hear a lot of sounds, but I don't always understand or compute what the sounds mean. And so, uh, and, and I mean, it's a beautiful sound that comes from my wife. I love, in fact, most nights at, at bedtime I say things like, hey, can you just tell me about your day? Because it helps me fall asleep. It's wonderful. <laughs> And she's just got this soothing, angelic tone. So I'm like, can you, just, can you just touch my face and just rub my face and then tell me about your day? And then I, I'm done. And um, it's because I care. And this week, uh, you know, she had a doctor's appointment this past week. And allegedly, she had asked me to be on kid pickup duty on Thursday afternoon. Apparently. So she says... Got no record of this conversation. She also asked me to be on parenting duty, basically babysitting, on Friday. Just joking. You don't babysit your own children. You care for them. You parent them. You shepherd them. So she asked me to be ready. She said, I've got this doctor's appointment, and it's going to be, you know, whatever. And so I really need you to, like, help me Thursday afternoon. I need you to pick up the kids, and then I need you to really be on tap Friday morning. I was a legend on Friday, everybody. I got all the kids ready. I did the dishes. We left a clean house. It was amazing. I went for the drop-off. I walked everybody into their classrooms. I said hi to the teachers. I went to, the, I went to preschool orientation. It was me and a bunch of moms at preschool orientation. I'm just playing it cool, just trying to be, you know, hey, hey, how's your summer? Hey, did you go anywhere? Just trying to play it cool. I crushed it on Friday. But Thursday, I didn't know. Thursday rolls around. It was not on my radar. It was not in my calendar. And so she's in the office. She's meeting with somebody. And I, you know, and I feel bad for some of our office staff because they often get caught in the middle of, of Natasha and I fleshing out deep-rooted issues in our marriage. And so she's having a meeting and I walk by, and sometimes when I know she's in the building, it's hard for me to focus. And so I just walk over where she is because she's pretty, and I just want to see her. And so I just kind of walk by because she's pretty, and I just want to see her. I'm like, hey, how's your meeting? She's like, you got the kids this afternoon, right? Huh? No? You got my calendar. I got, I got stuff in my calendar. She's like, no. I mean, there are, there are witnesses to this conversation. There are people. We have, a, we have a, a communal co-working office space. So, like, we're there fleshing out marriage issues in front of other people. She says, no, nah, we talked about this. God, I don't, remember, I don't remember nothing. We did not have this conversation. She says, I had the instructions on a piece of paper from the doctor. I read them to you, and I said, you're going to need to help me on Thursday. I'm like, it's Thursday. It's not in my calendar. I got something else in my calendar. What am I supposed to do? And she's like, no, I, I told you. And I said, listen, just because you made audible sounds with your mouth 
that contained information that you understood and I was in the room does not mean that I understood the audible sounds that came out of your mouth. Just because you said it doesn't mean I heard it. I'm like, did I stop and look at you? Well, you were right there. I'm like, did I acknowledge the request? Well, you didn't say no. Um, did we put it in the calendar? Apparently not. Did, like, I'm like, I need help with this stuff. You can't just say something with me in the room and think that I got it because I hear you, but I'm not really listening. Like, I love you, and I, and I hear the noise, but there's another step for me. Like, it's not just the noise. We got to process the information together. You got you to gotta follow up with me. You don't just tell me something. You got to look into my eyes. Then you got to look into my soul. Then you got to look into my calendar. You got to make sure that I've said, yes, ma'am, I'll be there. I'll take care of it. I'm on it. You've got, you got to follow up with me. You can't just throw this stuff out there and think that I know. If it's important to you, that's how I communicate. And I mean, of course, it led to, you never listened to me. I feel like sometimes I'm just talking and nobody even cares. I'm like, I care, I care, I just, you gotta rein me in. I got a lot of things going on in my mind. It was Thursday, I was thinking about football. I was thinking about the kids. And when you said, I need your help on Thursday, I'm thinking, cool, are we gonna order wings or pizza? I can do that, we're gonna watch football together. I checked out after I need your help. She's frustrated. See, but then, then on the other side, I'm different. So, so when I'm talking to her, I don't let her get away with, like, just being in the room and hearing the noise. I need to see her eyes. Like, I push for that because that's how I know I, I, I hear better when someone's staring into my soul. So when we're having a conversation, like, every Saturday night, you know, she's such a, such a great support. And so on Saturday nights, um, I always say, like, hey, can I, can I just process with you the things the Lord's been speaking to me this week and what I want to share with the church tomorrow. This is like, can we just, can we go there together to a deep spiritual place and just consider how we can best lead and love our church family? And so, so this, this happened last night and the night, it's been happening every Saturday night for six years, okay? And so I'm like, hey, so I'm going to read this verse and then I'm going to start in on this. And then I look over on the couch Oh, like, whoop. My, hey, I'm talking to you. Can you, like, are you taking, no, you were, no, that's Instagram. You were not taking notes. Can you, last night, I'm not joking. I'm like, can you just, can you put down your phone? I just need, like, I need five minutes. I just need five minutes. I just want to really tell you what's on my heart for five minutes. She puts down her phone, and she doesn't think I'm looking. I'm watching. She's like, <laughs> I'm like, those posts are not going anywhere. You're not getting that many likes in the next five minutes. But I need her to zone in. I need her to look at me. I need her to listen. I want her to listen with her eyes. Like, I need that connection. C communication is crazy, man. It's hard. It's not easy. <coughs> in fact, what happens is when she puts, it's a, it's a double-edged sword for me, because when she puts down her phone, she all of a sudden, like even last night, I'm trying to, I'm like, and then the Lord said this, and Jesus said this, and man, this is going to help somebody's life. And she's like, I'm like, what? I'm preaching in the living room. She's like, well, I guess it's just not that interesting. <laughs> okay, back to the drawing board. Can you just hang with me for a few minutes? So fun, because then one, once you actually, like, engage and listen, like, people are listening. There are really two different types of listeners. There are people who listen to understand. That's what she wants. She wants someone to listen to understand. I don't listen to understand. I listen to fix things. So she wants, she wants to tell everything about her day. She just wants someone to be like, oh, 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 wow, oh, oh, I get it. Oh, you poor thing. Oh, okay. That's what, that's what she wants, someone who just listen and understand. But then there are people who listen to respond. I'm a listen to respond kind of guy. <coughs> she starts talking. I'm thinking about the next thing I get to say. 
Like, when is she going to pause so I can jump in and say, hey, but did you? I like when we're talking for her to listen to respond. I want to engage in a conversation. So I'm telling, and she's just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, do you hear me? Like, I want to have a conversation about this. I'm just, I understand. I don't want you to understand. I want to talk about it. Some people listen to respond. Some people listen to understand. I think that everybody in the room today, we all in our core want to believe that God wants to do something new and more in your life. We're there. We believe that. And even as we've looked at Second Chronicles, we see the steps. It's humble and pray and seek his face and repent, turn from our sin. The first promise that he gives is that he will hear us. But I think for too many of us in our spiritual lives, that's where it stops because we feel like, well, I've done this and I've done my part and I've held up my end of the deal. And I'm just not convinced that God even hears me. Like, it doesn't look like he hears me. Things aren't changing like he hears me. I mean, there's no way God is actually listening, and there is no pain like the pain of being unheard. I love, there's a story in Mark chapter 10 that leads us through a scene where someone's heard by Jesus. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. It says, they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed them. A large crowd, other versions say a great multitude. We're talking about a lot of people here. You like these new EC water bottles? Oh, that's so refreshing. A large crowd. Jesus is moving from Jericho to Jerusalem. It is the last week of his life. The Passover is imminent. It's coming. The road is jammed with Jewish travelers, people making the pilgrimage to the holy city. Not just jammed with congestion, they're partying on the way into the city. It's hype. It's a crazy environment. See, there's this young rabbi named Jesus who has been standing up to the religious elite. He's been um, confronting them in the temple. They've been having crazy conversations. He's been challenging the establishment. So you don't have to like him. You don't even have to agree with him. But what's happening is Jesus is on his way, and everybody knows it's going to be good. Love him or hate him, Jesus shows up in Jerusalem. There's going to be some energy. It's a charged atmosphere. It's crazy on the road. It's, it's like carnival. It's like a giant parade. It's the Red Mile in 2004. The Calgary Flames, Game 7. Tampa Bay Lightning. Imagine the red mile if the flames hadn't lost. That's what this is like. <laughs> Hype. Crazy. Loud. It's wild. There's crowds everywhere. It says a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. You see, for all of the fanfare... For all the party, the celebration, the atmosphere of the crowded streets, there was another crowd present at the same time. There wasn't just the people who were headed to the party. You have this crowd that's been pushed to the side. The seekers, the skeptics, the sinful, the diseased, the unwelcome, the unable, the unwanted, the uninterested in this party. Pushed to the sides. The entire gospel of Mark is written for that crowd. See, Mark's gospel is directed specifically at a Gentile audience, meaning non-Jewish, anybody who is considered to be on the outside. So you'll find in Mark's gospel a lot of moments where he explains Jewish custom and tradition. You'll find moments he talks about a boy with an evil spirit, little children, the blind man of Bethsaida, a dead girl, a sick woman, a demon-possessed man, all people that had been pushed to the sidelines. And the message, the overwhelming message of Mark to the readers is, listen, this story, this Messiah, he's for you too. Bartimaeus is an onlooker. He has natural limitations that have pushed him to the outside. It says this in verse 47. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. I want to highlight what happens in these couple verses because I think it's reflective of our prayerful progression. See, you've got a man. Now, this, is, this would be like the sped up 
time-lapsed version. For you, it might not all happen in a verse or two, but, but this is the way prayer t- tends to work for a lot of us. Our faith is stirred, so we pray to God, we cry out to him, and then in a moment of pause, discouragement comes. We think it could work, we pray, we try our best, nothing happens immediately, and in that space, discouragement shows up. Be quiet! Shut up! This is embarrassing, you're breaking protocol, it's unacceptable, you're on the outside, you're not supposed to call out to him, you're not invited to this party, this isn't for you. And see, when you start to get passionate, there will always be people that you make uncomfortable. There will always be people who get angry when you decide you want to participate instead of spectate. There are always going to be people when you decide, listen, I don't want to just attend, I want to engage. There are going to be people that feel weird being around you. Why are you so into it? Why are you so involved? Why are you so passionate? See, here's the thing, it's not your issue. Because, see, passion will offend people, but it only offends people because you're shining a light on their apathy. That's what's happening in this moment. You've got a man on the side of the road who knows the king of the universe is walking by and says, Hey! Hey! I'm tired of being here! Man, I, I love that we're passionate, church. I love... I love that it's hard to be apathetic in this church. Because you know what? You get get one passionate person, he's like, man, that's unfortunate. But then you look over here, there's another passionate person just serving, worshiping, jumping, dancing. I love it. So the voices come from the crowd, but maybe, maybe in your life, in your situation, it's not just outside voices. Maybe the crowd's on the inside. Maybe your mind is crowded with thoughts of insecurity. Maybe your mind is crowded with voices of fear. Maybe your mind is crowded with unmet expectations. Maybe your mind is crowded with pride. And so you think you should pray again, but in that moment between your prayer and God responding, you have the discouragement of, of why do you even bother? What's the point? You've prayed for cancer, but you've, you've believed for the miracle, but you've seen nothing and you've heard nothing. And inside, your rational self is screaming at you, this doesn't make sense. Have you ever seen him? Has he ever talked to you? Why are you praying to somebody you can't see? Maybe you've lost somebody that you love. And there's a battle going on inside your heart, inside your mind. The voice is telling you, see? I told you it wasn't going to work. I told you he didn't hear you. I told you he doesn't care. I told you it was a waste of your time. Maybe you've been praying for your children, and you've been believing that God's going to get a hold of their lives, but you've been praying and praying, and it feels like it's just silence from heaven, like there's no response, there's no change, there's no miracle, there's no parodicals returning home, there's no signs that heaven even cares. And nothing hurts like the pain of being unheard. Because see, what happens is when you're unheard, you feel misunderstood. And when you feel misunderstood, you feel devalued. And when you feel devalued, you start to disconnect. Right? That's what happens in marriage relationships. I'm unheard. He doesn't get me. He doesn't respect me. He doesn't value me. And you start to shut off. It happens in friendships. It happens even in work relationships. You don't feel heard. You don't feel valued. You start to disconnect and disengage. And I'm telling you right now, the devil wants you to think that God is not listening. Because the devil wants you to think that God doesn't understand you. He wants you to think that God doesn't value you. He wants you to think that you should just stop trying altogether. Uh, But not Bartimaeus. The voices were loud. Shut up. Stop it. I love what he does. It says he only shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. It's interesting. I'm shouting a lot because he shouted. (laughs) See, what he heard was that Jesus of Nazareth was in the neighborhood. Jesus of Nazareth 
a term used by the religious elite to downplay the significance of who Jesus really was. What he heard, it was almost, it was almost a derogatory term. Jesus from an obscure little village. Jesus, the nobody. <coughs> Jesus, he's common. Jesus, there's nothing special about Jesus. Jesus, the guy from, from Nazareth, is here. Who cares? See, the crowd, on their way to the Passover, on the way to the party, on the way to the feast, on the way to this big event, this pilgrimage, they were still treating Jesus like he was common. And when you start to think he's common, you start to treat him like he's casual. And in some ways, we have allowed Jesus to become too common, even in our culture. Like, we, like we're talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but we treat him with a very casual attitude. Why? Because we have so much access. You can turn on a podcast wherever you go and get a little bit of Jesus, and then you can turn him off when you don't want him anymore. You can turn on some worship music at any place, at any point, at any time. You can get ushered into his presence in your car, on the, on the sea train. You can throw in your AirPods, and you can be hanging out with Jesus at your desk. But, but, but then as soon as you don't want him anymore, you can turn it off. Even the environments we meet in have a lot more to do with maximizing our own comfort than they do with actually meeting with the God of the universe. See, we've got, we've got to make sure the temperature is right and we want the lights to be right and we want the volume to be right so that we can sing and we feel like we sound good. That's not you. It's them. <laughs> That's why they're up here. We want everything to be perfect. And see, the Jews in Jerusalem had this thought. They believed that David was their father, and they believed that the son of David would be the Messiah. And right here, for the very first time, a blind man who's been pushed to the outside makes a bold declaration. The first time it had been publicly declared that Jesus wasn't just the guy from Nazareth. He was the son of David. The first time. He was blind, but he could see something nobody else could see. Everybody else was treating him as common, but then there's this guy pushed to the outside who has a little bit of passion and a little bit of desperation. He says, in, in essence, in that culture and context, it's like, he's not common. He is the Messiah. He's the son of David. It's the first time he's introduced publicly as the son of David. Faith sees what other people don't see. Faith knows what other people don't know. Faith causes you to behave differently. It causes you to throw off like Bartimaeus would do his coat and run towards the one that can give us life. James 5.16 says the fervent prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Fervent means passionate intensity. I'm looking for some people who are ready to work worship and cry out and get off the sidelines and approach Jesus with some passion and some intensity. Listen, I know you. You're not that different than me. We're messy. We got problems. We got issues. All of us, to some extent, know what it's like to look from the sidelines and feel unworthy and feel unwelcome and feel like we don't deserve to be at the party in the first place. But listen, when you know you're a mess and you understand that you're a mess and you know you got issues and you have the revelation that there's one person that can make a difference, one hope, one option, you cannot be casual and commonplace when you're looking at your only hope. Better yet, when somebody saves your life, you don't treat the person who saves your life like you treat everybody else. You approach them differently. You hold them up differently. You can't just sit there and let Jesus walk by when there's a crowd of people and you know he's got the ability to do miracles. We are not a just sit there church. We are a get up off the sidelines, passionately go after something. When someone tells us to stop, we're going to get louder. When someone tells us it's ridiculous, we're going to dream bigger. When somebody tells us it's impossible, we're going to let them know that we've got Jesus, and with Jesus, nothing is impossible. So if we say we can take the city, we're going to believe we can go after the whole city because we're not going to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. I hate the voices. Be quiet. It's too crazy. It's not possible. You're getting too rowdy. You're getting too loud. It's not right. 
he hears the voice, says, son of David, have mercy on me. See, if you really want to pray, you don't need to have the right religious language. You don't need a formula. You don't even need to be on your knees with blessing singing in the corner of your room. <laughs> you don't need that. That was, that was my best blessing right there. <laughs> Oh, man, it taught her everything she knows. <laughs> no, what you do need is to remember that Jesus is anything but common. When you remember that he's Christ, he's not common, you just have to let your passion take over. Because when you really understand that he's not just Jesus, he's not just a small town boy, he's not just the son of a carpenter, he's the Messiah, he's the miracle worker, he's the Christ. We sang about it today in every location. He conquered the grave so that you and I could have confidence to face the things that we'd face. He came in the appearance of a man so that you and I could relate to him, but he was fully God on the cross so that you and I could be redeemed by him. We need some passionate Jesus loving people who are going to run hard that aren't content just to sit there but want to get in on the action. Well, I, I just don't think I can. I'm not ready. What? He was blind. You know, a lot of, you know what? There were other blind people on the road. You know what they did? They let their issue Keep them on the outside. You know what he did? He heard Jesus with his ears. He heard, he heard about him, sorry, with his ears. He cried out to him with his mouth. Then he got up on his legs. Listen, there's a lot more you've got working than not. You've got to get over the one issue that you do have. Use the things that God has still given you, the things that still work. You've got to get over your excuses and get in the game. It says when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. He heard him in that crowd with all that noise. Listen, he's on the ground. You've got thousands of people in the street singing, carrying on, getting all crazy. How does Jesus hear one man from a distance from the ground when he's walking through a crowd of thousands of people who are making crazy noise? Jesus was on his way to fulfill his mission. He was on his way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem means the place of peace. Jesus was on his way to go to the cross and make peace between God and humanity. He was on his way, but he stops dead in his tracks. Why? 1 John 5.14 says, And this is the confidence that we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. See, what we have in the story is a blind man begging for mercy. Jesus is mercy personified. And so this wasn't a deterrent from his mission. It was, again, an opportunity to display why he came in the first place. See, Jesus was going to show up, and, and he wanted to let everybody know that he came for the people on the outside. He came for the people that everyone else pushed to the side. Other people might have given up on you, but Jesus hears you. You might have given up on yourself, but Jesus hears you. You might not be where you want to be in your life right now, but Jesus hears you. And the physical blindness he's about to heal is going to serve as a demonstration and a picture for the spiritual blindness that will be forever healed a week later when he hangs on the cross. He says, if we ask anything according to his will, his agenda, we just need to have alignment with the agenda of Christ. He tells us to pray, pray that, pray that God's kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it, in, as it is in heaven. So pray your prayers, but never forget to ask for his kingdom to come. Love it, Mark Batterson says, prayer is the difference between the best we can do and the best God can do. You just got to trust that God's best is best for you. It says, when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on. He's calling you. And we have friends like that. Shut up. You're an idiot. Stop it. Oh, it worked. Come on. You want me to come with you? Cool. Yeah, we can be friends. Oh, you got a promotion. Oh, yeah, I've been praying for you the whole time. This is amazing. Have me out for lunch. 
Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. Does God hear you? Yes, every time. He hears every prayer. He hears every cry. Notice, though, Bartimaeus still has not heard Jesus. His friends said, hey, he heard you. He's calling you. Come on. He hasn't heard him yet. I think sometimes we think we're unheard because we haven't heard. Hearing and trusting that God listens has very little to do with what he says back. See, we expect a certain type of response. Maybe he is responding and you just got too much other noise in your life that you can't really hear what he's saying. But what does Bartimaeus do despite the noise? He still hasn't even heard Jesus, but he keeps calling and he keeps coming. How do you, how do you know? What do you do if you really believe he's heard? Even if you haven't heard back from him, you just keep calling and you keep coming. You just keep calling out to him and coming to him. You keep calling and coming. You keep bringing your requests. You call out to him and you come to him. You call out to him and you come to him. Finally, he's face to face with Jesus. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked my rabbi, the blind man, said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go for your faith is healed. Instantly, the man could see. And he followed Jesus down the road. Keep calling. Keep coming. He hears you. Keep calling. Keep coming. Keep calling. Keep coming. Don't stop. I know you've been disappointed, but keep calling and keep coming. I know there's, there's voices in your head. There's voices in your life telling you it's not going to work. Keep calling. Keep coming. Keep calling. Keep coming. Why should I keep calling? Keep coming. Because he listens. He always listens. Jesus is the complete listener. He's the best listener. Because, see, he, he's got the ability to listen, to understand, and listen to respond at the same time. See, he understands. He knew what the man was going through. Jesus knew that the man wasn't just after the physical miracle. He knew that the man saw something different, knew something different, had a revelation of something deeper. That's why when he came up, Jesus said, hey, your faith has healed you. And immediately we see that the man, Bartimaeus, starts following Jesus. Jesus understood there was more to the man than what everybody else saw. Jesus understands you. He can relate to you. He gets your emotions. He understands your pain. He's been through it. He understands your circumstances. He understands your anxiety. I mean, he sweat blood the night before he went to the cross. You don't think Jesus knows stress? No, he gets you. You can trust that he hears you because you can trust that he understands you, but he doesn't just understand, he responds. And you don't always hear the response you want. You don't always hear the response you're anticipating. But just because you can't hear him saying back what you want him to say back to you doesn't mean that he did not hear you. And the truth of it is, if we'd look to the cross, we'd realize in a hurry his death was the response we needed. His death is the response we needed. I love this. John 1 John 5, 14, which we read, this is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Check out verse 15. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, oh, man, this is so good. We know that we already possess what we've asked of him. If you know that he hears and understands, then you can also trust that you already possess what you need. Keep calling and keep coming. Just keep calling and keep coming. Prayer isn't just about changing your problem. Prayer is often about changing your perspective. And I believe we need to remind each other today that Jesus has already responded. When I remember that he understands, I can trust him with my prayers. When I remember that he responds on the cross, then the healing I need, he's already released it. The joy I need is available in abundance. The hope you're desperate for, he's already provided for you. The mere miracle that you're waiting on. It's already in motion. The freedom that you need is here for you to take. He's already given you what you need in the cross. He hears you. He understands. And he responds. Man, I'm so thankful for a God that's not distant, a God that's not far off, 
a God that's not disconnected, but a God that hears me and understands me and has already responded to everything I could ever need. He's already responded. I'd like you to bow your heads. Every location. He's already responded. God hears you. God hears you. God hears you. Keep calling and keep coming. Just keep calling and just keep coming at every location. That's the encouragement for today. Don't stop praying, but keep calling and keep coming. Just keep calling and keep coming. He hears you. He hears you. He hears you. He hears you. There's some people in all of our rooms across the city today. And you've been in that place. It feels like God is disconnected. It feels like he's distant. It feels like he doesn't hear you. You can't imagine how, with what you've seen happen in your life, how could God really be concerned? I'm telling you, he hears, he understands, and he's already, you already possess what you need in him. So with everybody's heads bowed, everybody's eyes closed at every location, nobody's moving. It's a quiet moment, a private moment between you and the God of the God of the universe, I'm going to count to three. And some of you have been trying to succeed in life by yourself. You've been trying to make it on your own. You've been trying to get through in your own strength, in your own power, in your own ability. And I'm telling you, God is not far off. He's here. He's close. And all you need to do is make the decision to have a relationship with him. I'm going to count to three. And when I hit three, if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, when I hit three, I want you to slip up your hand. It's just a physical sign of what's going on inside your heart. It's just a sign that says, hey, Jesus, I can't do this without you. I know that you hear me. I trust you. I trust you. I give you my life. Here we go. One, two, in the North Campus, downtown. Stay with me. This is for you, too. Here we go. Three. Go ahead. Lift up your hands. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, incredible. I'm going to ask you to put your hands down at all the locations in just a minute. Pastor Jason is going to come to the stage, Pastor Mike downtown, they're going to give you some next steps, but before they do, I just wonder, can we pray together? If you made that decision in your heart, maybe you raised a hand. Let's say, let's say this prayer, repeat this prayer after me, EC family, let's all say it together. Say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life today. I give you everything. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give it up, everybody. The people that made that decision today, we're so, so proud of you. We're so proud of you.